Um, how many of you have read any of the work of George Garrett? Raise your hand. A couple of people have. The reason that not more of you have read his work, there are two reasons. One is that he wrote in just about every genre known to the literary world. <clears throat> the other is that he was a southerner. <laughs> that worked against him too. If, um, if, if, if it were not for those two factors, you would know his name as well as you know the name of Philip Roth or Norman Mailer. He was a great writer, also a great man, an incomparably generous man who single-handedly helped launch more careers, literary careers, in this country than anybody else. Um, he, he died last month at the age of 78. He had completed 35 very vivid and resonant books in this whole slew of genres, novels, short fiction, poetry, journalism, criticism, plays, screenwriting. There are journals that are going to come out eventually, and I'm, I may be leaving something out, oh, memoir. <clears throat> and various translations, and he also edited 18 anthologies, some of which were the mode for launching some of the writers that he did launch. His prizes included the Prix de Rome from the American Academy, um, a Ford Foundation grant, a Rockefeller Foundation grant, a Guggenheim, the Cleanth Brooks Medal for Lifetime Achievement, the Penn Malamud Award, for Excellence in Short Fiction, the Aiken Taylor Award for Modern American Poetry, and the very distinguished T.S. Eliot Award from the Ingersoll Foundation. His life's work was to create a body of literature that comments upon itself, that recapitulates patterns, draws connections among parts, and in effect mirrors its own grand design, doubling its breadth and depth. That is to say, there is the work and there is the shadow work, an implied reflection, a point I'll come back to later. Garrett is emphatically, wholly, sometimes unnervingly, and always actively present in his work. He is also for reasons that are difficult to pinpoint, um, the writer from whom a younger writer or a novice writer can possibly learn the most. His reading, his writing will teach you how to write. We will have some of his books for sale at the reading tonight, and I hope some of you will want to buy them because um, he, he was a great writer, but also a great writer who was a teacher at heart. I don't mean that his books are explanatory. I just mean that he, he takes you along in the books in such a way that you can begin to see his pattern making. And this is extraordinarily helpful to a novice writer. <clears throat> in his essay, The Huge Footprint, The Short Stories of George Garrett, David R. Slavitt observes that, quote, to admire Garrett properly is to try to learn from him, to use his work to come to some understanding of what the different literary genres offer and demand of him as author and of us as readers. Almost certainly, they occasion different refractions of our visions of, of society. He goes on to say that any serious study of literature and its relation to what happens in the world ought to take such a question as one of its central concerns, if not its absolute starting point. In other words, how does a writer settle on a form for his work at hand? Does he? Slavitt asked, even have a choice. 
George Garrett was interested in the ways in which the boundaries among genres blur, either because they must blur or because they may be rewardingly blurred. And as Slavitt says, we can all learn a great deal about genre from reading him. The subjects of the earlier work ran a gamut from the Elizabethan era, as in his trilogy of powerful, persuasive, transporting novels, which, this is not an exaggeration, redefined historical fiction for the modern reader. I, I particularly rec recommend his novel, uh, Death of the Fox, which is uh, about Sir Walter Raleigh. It was a bestseller when it came out. It's the first of a wonderful trilly, trilogy. Um, he, had, he had more knowledge and understanding of the Elizabethans than most scholars. And in fact, Princeton decided years later after George had left the graduate program to, to write full time, uh, decided to give him a PhD on the basis of his trilogy. It ranges from that historical fiction to devastating or humorous and sometimes both tales of military life, to racism, to American manifestations high and low of religion, to politics and popular culture, to the relationship between the sexes, and to the vexed relationship between art and advertisement, or we might say civilization and commerce. Praising another writer for his diversity of subjects, Garrett noted that a writer who writes only one kind of book is either obsessive and can't help himself, or a hypocrite and a hustler of a single brand name. Garrett uh, pulled no punches in his, in his uh, essays about publishing. From the beginning, Garrett de determined to avail himself of any genre by which he could approach the truth as he saw it, which was a Janus truth, a truth that contradicts itself. In his study, Understanding George Garrett, R. H. W. Dillard, using the Christian terminology that Garrett himself often used, put it this way, It is the recognition that the bleakness of the fallen world is the truth, but not the whole truth that enables the equally fallen human being to bless the day. I suppose I might word it even more starkly as an acceptance of the utter helplessness of any human being to guarantee even his own existence, much less the existence of anybody else, and a simultaneous awareness of the gifts of grace. He was an amazingly happy person. His career had ups and downs, as, as almost every long career does. Uh, he had his share of trials and tribulations in his personal life. And at any time of day, any day of the year, he'd have a big grin on his face. The moods or modes in which Garrett perceives his truth range from tragedy to wit to slapstick comedy to satire to, to contemplative to pedagogical to lyrical at least. He is capable of a keening rhetoric that possesses Shakespearean dimension. The trilogy shares with Thomas Mann an eye-catching perspective on time. Fact and fiction are as intermingled in Garrett's work as in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. The voice can be as intimate and humorous and colloquial as Mark Twain's. The American South can be as present in Garrett's work as it is in the work of William Faulkner, one of Garrett's admitted models. There is no branding his product. His productivity was the natural result of an incisive curiosity, a desire to encompass as much of the world as possible. Casey Claybo refers to, Garrett, to quote, Garrett's peripatetic, swashbuckling sensibility, a beguiling phrase that wonderfully, wonderfully captures both the man and his book. In an autobiography written at the behest of the Gale Publishing Company, Garrett begins not with the facts of his life, but by telling a 
Presumably, we take the storyteller's word, nonfiction story in which we see, quote, two men dressing. They are wearing GI undershorts and shiny dog tags like necklaces. They are freshly shaved and showered. Their hair is cut short on top and sidewalled. They are flat stomached and hard muscled. Two American soldiers in, high, in a high ceiling room located in the heart of an old Luftwaffe barracks a little to the south of the city of Linz. When, we have, when they have finished dressing, we notice their armbands. The soldiers are MPs. We don't arrive at anything obviously autobiographical until we have watched them move off, quote, move off side by side in step and are told that, quote, the sergeant, of course, is myself. Then we encounter a portion of autobiography, but the sergeant's story will continue to interrupt the autobiography each time pulling us deeper in, creating suspense, and moving us forward to the end. It is a brilliant gambit and also a lesson. The fuel of all good narrative, Garrett advises in his title essay, Going to See the Elephant, is suspense. Suspense is not merely a matter of what happens next. It is a series of tantalizing questions. I think that's as good a definition of suspense as I have ever heard, and it, it brings it out of the realm of literary criticism or theory into the realm of the writer's desk. Suspense is not merely a matter of what happens next, it is a series of tantalizing questions. So we have a story in third person spliced into nonfiction in first. Why not? It's important to notice that we read the story as if it were true. It seems to dovetail with the facts we can verify. Garrett was in the army. He made sergeant. He spent time in Linz. But he might be making stuff, some stuff anyway, up. Did the soldiers really put their belt buckles in back to keep them from getting scratched? Did they really wear artillery scarves instead of ties? But wait. Garrett tells us that he's forgotten just what the patch on the left shoulder looked like. Surely that means he is telling the truth about everything else. Or does it? We cannot know. What we do know is that so much precise detail, so casually delivered, delineates a scene so real that, except in the present case of a critical essay, we question none of it. In fact, we are in it, in the barracks, watching those two guys pull their uniforms together, heading out with them. Let's take the author at his word. The story about the soldiers is a nonfiction story, as true as the rest of his autobiography. But how true is that? Garrett quotes Wright Morris, anything processed by memory is fiction. Whoops, now all of the autobiography is up for questioning. Finally, we accept it because it is told authoritatively. The speaker persuades us that he knows whereof he speaks. It speaks the truth. The truth, as Garrett has described it, is the truth of the committed imagination. Dillard unpacks this statement shrewdly. He says that the good writer, quote, is not engaged in an assertion of self, but is rather committing his or her imagination to the demands of the work itself and to a truth which the writer both finds in the work and gives to it. Now we find ourselves speaking of memory, as in autobiography, and imagination. Poet and critic Henry Taylor made this important observation regarding Garrett's poetry. The autobiographical essay Garrett wrote for the contemporary author's autobiographical series provides unusually strong evidence that the poem, another work, Whistling in the Dark, is autobiographical. Yet. Though the poem is based on fact, 
the constant and paradoxical tension between the present and the past, between memory and imagination, is the source of its power. The poem and the story of the two soldiers make use of the same events in Linz, Austria. Memory and imagination are always at play in Garrett's work, sometimes as a source of energy, sometimes, as we see it at a later point in his career, as mutual compliments. For him, perhaps, the work was not complete until it contained both memory and imagination. It is the two together that both fuel and unify his work. In his book, Going to See the Elephant, Pieces of a Writing Life, Garrett's prevailing metaphor is the old story of the blind man who endeavored to describe the creature they encountered. For one, the elephant's side was like a wall. For another, who felt the trunk, it was snake-like. The third grabbed hold of the elephant by the tail and declared it a rope. All three were, of course, right, Garrett tells us, and therein lies a meaning. You have to discover the truth for yourself. And even then, it will be only the truth you have grasped. To find the truth as a writer, you must write. There is no other way to conjure or confront the creature. Only after the elephant has been met can the writing teacher be of use to the novice writer. And what the writing teacher can then do is help the writer to revise. Revision, Garrett says, is really what we are talking about in all of our classes and workshops. In this essay <clears throat> by George Garrett, and I, I hope that that book will be present tonight, uh, we get pretty much all of the advice for revision that we will ever need. Every writer should read this essay. Uh, one example is that once you've written the, the story, go back and revise against the grain of it. If you've written a lyrical story, go back and focus on the narrative. If you've written um, uh, a hero against a villain, go back and see if the hero is not villainous in some way and the villo, villain heroic in some way. Always revise against the grain. Another piece of advice is to uh, use every one of the five senses on every single page. Uh, another is that the most important decision you will ever make regarding your narrative is the order in which you reveal information to the writer. All of these points are in his essay. There are a couple of other essays in there, however, that will remove the scales of the stars, whichever those obscuring dreams are, from the beginning writer's eyes. We learn that, quote, more and more American literary art isn't about anything that matters to anybody. We also learn that contemporary American publishing is not much interested in good literature. We, we learn that we have just finished a decade of some of the, the most polished and boring poetry and some of the most competent and inconsequential fiction in our national history. But isn't it better to be cognizant of and ready to face these rude realities than to stumble upon them unprepared and unarmed? And anyway, I wonder how any writer can listen to those comments without rising to the challenge of trying to prove him wrong. Another essay, essay, in the collection of essays, is a poem. And again, one asks, why not? Plenty of poems have been presented as essays, not at least among them a number by Alexander Pope. Garrett's poem essay is titled Preface to Lives of the Poets, calling up for Samuel Johnson's Lives of the Poets, which devotes most of its space to Pope. In the poem, a poet putting pen to yellow legal pad, uh, George always wrote on a yellow legal pad, everything, retails some anecdotes about himself and other poets, mostly dead, who, quote, ghost him and remind him of, quote, the dark which takes the poets, one and all, into its arms, and gently awards the democratic prizes of perfect silence, of honorable oblivion.
Is my voice still carrying back up there okay? Yep. Okay. <laughs> we do not mistake a work by Garrett for a work by anybody else. Garrett's voice is the voice of a storytelling friend, familiar, spellbinding, joshing, soothing, crafting, crafty, intriguing. It is a voice that beckons us to follow it as surely as if we were being led down or up a path. This holds true even when the voice changes inflections or diction or perspective as Garrett's voice revels in doing. Authorial vision is a more mysterious matter, perhaps in part simply because not all writers have one. Garrett does. Dillard's Understanding Garrett is the place to go for a detailed discussion of Garrett's faith and its relationship to his work. That faith is inclusive, embracing, and Episcopalian. Dillard traces a line from Garrett to the early Christian St. Augustine to the parables of Jesus, arguing that as do the last, Garrett embodies, as do the last two, Garrett embodies his moral and aesthetic principles in his work. I imagine that one might say his moral and aesthetic principles are the skeleton, the bones, that art fleshes out. The point is a living body of work. Voice and vision are revealed at every turn in a writer's work. They are inherent in the block from which chips are chipped. He I've, didn't have time for this passage, but he once referred to all of his work in all of the genres as being chips off the same block. They may sometimes be well disguised. I took advantage of the variety of work I was doing to play off one form against another, Garrett tells us, but turn them toward the light and the grain shows. In his brilliant late novel, Double Vision, a writer named George Garrett suffering from double vision as a result of myasthenia gravis is asked to review a recent, the first, biography of the late Peter Taylor, the Pulitzer Prize-winning fiction writer who had been his next-door neighbor in Charlottesville. Reflecting on that relationship and on the shortcomings of the biography he is to review, narrator Garrett conceives of a character, Aubrey Carver, similar to but not identical with Taylor. He imagines another character, Frank Toomer, to represent himself, again, like but not identical, who will be able to comment on the fictional Carver, even as occasionally the real Garrett comments on the real Peter Taylor. This gets complicated. The fictional Garrett, Frank Toomer, has planned to write a novel about Robert Greene, Elizabethan poet and playwright, and, as Frank describes him to Aubrey, the bad side, like a bad twin of Shakespeare. Meanwhile, Aubrey Carver, the fictional Peter Taylor, had, at the end of his life, completed a novel about one Thomas Delancey in the World's Fair of 1893. Behind narrator Garrett, his remembered neighbor Taylor, Frank Toomer, Aubrey Carver, Robert Greene, and Thomas Delancey, is the George Garrett who is not on the page but writing the page. Garrett has given us a novel about how to write a novel, and it, but it is not that dreaded cliché, a novel about writing. It is a novel about a life of writing. A novel is not simply an extra-large hefty bag into which anything that turns up can be shoved, nor is it a short story gone long. Double vision shows us how the bits and pieces of a novel are patterned and or ordered to reflect and refract creating the wholeness and unity of a work of art, or a life. The very length of a novel is a metaphor for the length of a life, and double vision brings that truth home powerfully to the reader. The threat of terrorism, personal histories of war and domestic complexity, professional trials and physical illness, tradition and change, youth and age, are some of the concerns and conflicts that intensify the narrative of double vision and supply both breadth and depth. Garrett's characters are economically and clearly delineated and passionately motivated, and even before we are aware of it, we are involved with them up to the hilt, cheering their moments of triumph, regretting the stacked deck that is dealt to them and to everyone 
Who can resist a narrator who, like narrator Garrett, writes a postcard to the, quote, world, sending love and kisses and promising, quote, the next time I appear, blinking like a bear fresh from a long sleep in a deep cave, I will reveal shocking secrets. Who doesn't read then in eager anticipation of hearing what those secrets are? You'll find them in this book. He was 75. It was a daringly inventive novel, a book with which anyone interested in literary experimentalism in particular or in the future of the novel in general must become acquainted. We might ask, why so many characters who are doubles, or almost doubles? Why, for that matter, are events and anecdotes so often doubled in Garrett's work, a book review turning up in a novel, a poem reappearing as autobiography or vice versa, and many other reiterations of memory and imagination? Garrett, who was born in June 1929, has uh, elucidated his attraction to double speaking in his autobiographical memoir about, quote, an older brother who died at birth, but who has been always, and perhaps strangely, a haunting presence in my life. The doppelganger of folklore is a ghostly presence that resembles a living individual. Lacking both shadow and reflection, the traditional doppelganger may be a representative of evil or bad luck or doom. In Norwegian mythology, it was a self-image that went before the self, living the self's life in advance. Such a one may be in a position to counsel or warn the other. These days, we use the word to refer simply to an alter ego, a look-alike, though the notion of a split-off self still clings to it. Nor does the double always need these days to be a dark omen, but the idea that the two beings possess a special affinity for one another remains, as seems to be the real case with twins. In an earlier book, Bad Man Blues, we find Garrett's deeply moving personal essay, The Lost Brother, summing, summoning up the ghost of who I might have been. Having sensed a presence, quote, which may have been more a matter of wishing than anything else, he was less surprised than reassured when his mother told him that he had had an older brother who is now, quote, in the spirit world. This lost brother, Garrett writes, was and is himself as mysterious to me as Jacob's angel. Halfway through the essay, he quotes Montaigne, we are, I know not how, double in ourselves, so that what we believe we disbelieve and cannot rid ourselves of what we condemn." End quote. Like Dr. Jekyll, we harbor a Mr. Hyde inside ourselves. Or if the hidden self is not quite murderous, we are certainly aware of ambivalent feelings, contrary ideas, self-contradiction, mischievous impulses, vague intentions, and stray decisions. These are materials with which to create a character. Garrett calls on them to create, um, and some of these are from other books that I haven't mentioned, Town, Tone, Tumor, and even the once actual Robert Greene, um, who are in Double Vision. Um, and he views the once actual Robert Greene as the dark side of Shakespeare, or who Shakespeare might have been if he had not been Shakespeare. Town has sometimes played a kind of Jacob to my Esau, treating, tricking me out of my rightful inheritance and blessing, George writes. In another sense, Town has been a good and faithful companion, even if he is, like the human heart, desperately wicked and faithless. Town is the presumed, John Town is the presumed author of a book titled Poison Pen, which is so scurrilous and so, um, <laughs> astute about the publishing world that the publishing world didn't want to touch it. <laughs> and it came out from a, a very distinguished small press publisher. And if you ever want to have a lot of fun some, sometime, if you have a high tolerance for all the things that we think are wrong, you will enjoy John Town. 
Perhaps the doubles agitate him into a creative activity, or perhaps the double, doubles are a creative solution to agitation, or perhaps the sense of a comradely competition with the double is both a goad and a comfort, for how else will a lost brother be returned to life short of paradise? But I have to admit that I have used him, meaning his lost brother, Garrett confesses in double vision, exploited the idea of him in fiction, as we do all our living and our dead. Garrett's short fiction is among his most enduring work. Stories he wrote 50 years ago read as contemporary and engage today's students. His late story collection, Empty Bed Blues, gives us the story Feeling Good, Feeling Fine, one of the most poignant I have, he has ever written and one of the most poignant I've ever read by anybody. A young boy, the narrator in his youth, though his least favorite sport is baseball, has been instructed to play along with his mother's brother, a former baseball player who, back after a number of years in a mental hospital, is living with the family. Uncle Jack is emotionally fragile, physically out of shape. The young boy can hardly countenance it when his father tells him Uncle Jack used to be a pleasure to watch. Minor league, the boy says, rejecting the po that possibility out of hand. Then the story takes a leap into the future. We see that in time the boy will learn to be proud of Uncle Jack. But, returning to the present, which is the Great Depression, Uncle Jack and the boy come inside and during dinner hear that the boy's father has been told of a new brain operation that might work wonders for Jack. The mother burst into tears and the father slaps her. Hating to see this, knowing he is the cause of the altercation, Jack agrees to the operation. The results will be disastrous. The story leaves us in the last glow of a happy family that does not yet realize the grief that lies in front of them. This story is all of four pages long. At the end of it, we feel as if we have known this family ever since the Great Depression. Like Delmore Schwartz and his In Dreams Begin Responsibilities, we want to rush into the past and tell it to stop, <clears throat> stop before that operation can take place. Stop before the pedestrian gets run over, the child is kidnapped, the arsonist lights the fire, the tsunami hits, the blood test comes back. The feeling is heightened by the palpable reality of the story, the dialogue, the family, the quote, raw, wide feel, and quote, stroll into gradual dark. The boys, quote, sister and brother coming down the stairs like a pair of wild ponies. We are aware of everything Uncle Jack is going to lose, and, of course, of everything the family is going to lose. It's heartbreaking. Gator Bait, also in that collection, recounts the Saturday a sixth grade boy spent with his father in his father's law office. While the boy waits outside a closed door, the father is visited by two men who want to hire him to represent a defendant in such a way that the defendant will lose and be sentenced to death. This, the two men say, will help their cause. The defendant is mentally retarded, and by going to the chair, the two men say, he will redeem his otherwise useless life. The father will have nothing to do with this kind of chicanery and ghastly proposition. The father responds witheringly, and the two men leave. The boy hears his father sobbing in his office. While he waits for the sobbing to stop, he looks out the window and sees the two men getting in a car and driving off. But the day isn't over yet. Father and son go for an ice cream soda, and then by the son his first pair of long pants. Years later, when the father dies, he leaves a letter for his son. Quote, be yourself and fear no one. Reject all conformity to the standards and conventions that does not square with your own consecrated ideals. It is advice that Garrett followed in all his work. Memory reimagines the past. Imagination remembers a future that has not yet happened. 
The first occurs because memory is not fixed but changeable. The second because we know that time is not fixed but changeable. George Garrett's oeuvre is a complex embodiment of these truths, each of which is a part of the other, each of which doubles the other. Garrett liked to tell the story of how writer and historian Shelby Foote, during a brief residency at the University of Virginia, visited one of his classes and was asked by a student what Faulkner was really like. Foote had known him. Couldn't he answer the, this question? As Garrett told it, Foote replied that if the student wanted to know what Faulkner was like, he'd find him in the work. The whole of him was right there. Faulkner became his work. And there it was, Garrett said, a precise and articulate formulation of exactly what I had hoped for. Let my whole life be only in my work and everywhere equally. Yet as time went on, he discovered that the ideal was fallacious. Instead, he came to take, quote, his chief pride and joy in the knowledge that all of his work, quote, contains, more or less, the same truth of myself. And to that extent, I may have succeeded, if only by turning Shelby Foote's proposition inside out. Of course, writers live real lives, lives of, as Garrett emphasizes, facts. A writer's work necessarily reflects, distorted or not, those facts. But this was true of Faulkner, acknowledged by Garrett as a major influence on him as well. Garrett has put his life into his work as completely as Faulkner did and done it with more candor. As is true of Faulkner, if we look at the body of Garrett's work with all its doubles and doubling, we derive the sense of a master, an author, the mind overseeing the work. This creation of authorial self is what I mean by what I meant by a shadow work, but now I realize that light work might be a better term because we are talking about illumination. It is as if, reading the work, we are watching from an angle that permits us to see an image reflected in a mirror, and that mirror image reflected in another mirror, and so on. Through the images, we recognize a mind that has become its own, its unique and indispensable body of work. Any questions about George? Any, any questions about the work of George Garrett, on which I'm certainly not an expert, but I'm a huge fan? Uh, my question is on the work, but I just wondered if you had met him and what his life. Yeah. yeah, I met him quite early on uh, when I was in the graduate department of philosophy at the University of Virginia, and he had just come to teach in the English department, and two of my best friends were Henry Taylor and Richard Dillard. Um, both in English, and they started hanging out with him, so I did too. And the marvelous thing about George was, I mean, we were children. Richard was a little bit older, but, but Henry and I were children. And uh, we hadn't published anything except in the college literary magazine. And George Garrett, he never questioned this, either with us or with anybody else ever. If you said you wanted to be a writer, he took you at your word. You were going to be a writer. He treated you as one. Yeah. Yeah. Was Richard Dillard the guy who Annie Dillard married later? Yes. Uh, Annie was his first wife. Uh -huh. and, and Annie went on to two other husbands. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more details you want? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I could go on, but I won't. Okay. <laughs> Any, anything else? I know everybody's eager to get to coffee, but yeah. How do you spell Garrett? I meant to write this up. G-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. His middle name was Pal excuse me. His middle name was Palmer. So sometimes you'll see a P in there. But his work is always just signed George Garrett. Yeah. I'm just curious, to what to what degree do you think uh, a person like George Garrett is uh, uh, is a writer as 
Is is a what? Is is born as the writer. In other words, uh, it's just a natural talent of an athlete. Well, I think I think George acquired certain uh, values from his father very early on. <clears throat> his father was. Um, I mean, they lived. They were living in Florida, and his father was very anti-segregation. Uh, and butted heads um, to his own detriment, but he did. He butted heads and riled some folks pretty badly. And um, George admired him tremendously and copied him in, in, in every way that he could, except that he did know fairly early on he wanted to be a writer. But I think having... A, he published 30, George published 39 pieces, short stories and poems, in his undergraduate literary magazine at Princeton. 39 in late adolescence. That's a lot of, I mean, the magazine would have been lost without him, apparently. <laughs> um, he had that drive and that ambition and that uh, dedication early on, and how much of that came from his being a natural writer, and how much of it came from his wanting to be a writer, but having the same values his father had would be, would be very difficult to say. He had, he had published several books by the time he was 25, I think, and, and um, Catherine Ann Porter, at one point, being asked by some some reporter, um, you know, who, who who might be a, a forthcoming novelist to watch, a writer to watch, said George Garrett, and this was quite early in George's life too. So I don't know that you can distinguish between the two, between wanting to be a, a writer and being a natural born writer. If you want to be a writer, you will find a way to write. You will become to appear as a natural born writer. And there are, there are certainly people who have an enormous facility with language or a, a gift for narrative who don't feel that strong a drive, and, and who um, love to read, love to tell stories, but are not particularly compelled to write. I think, I think, basically, I guess I think, I don't know whether George would agree, I guess I think a writer is something you make yourself. You choose to become a writer, and you do that by writing. I, I can almost hear you, but not quite. I said, what do you think of creative writing classes? Uh -huh. Some say it's cycle creativity, some say that it helps. Well, I, I came out of an MFA program, and I was just elated to have free time to write and to be in a place where I wasn't being told I had to prepare to be a school teacher or a secretary. Um, and, and th I mean, that's what women were told then. And it was extraordinary to me to find this place where I could write and live and breathe writing. I think workshops can be very useful. At some point, you have to begin to trust your own judgment about your work. Because at some point, if you're, if you're writing really well, you'll be writing stuff that the other people don't necessarily understand. Um, that's, what, that's what it means to be original or to be pushing the barrier. You're going, to, you're going not to be understood. You have to understand yourself and make sure you're not just um, going off into never-never land. But I think workshops are use, useful, and they certainly do offer 
um, time and freedom and a rewarding um, companionship with other people in the same boat. I do sometimes think there's something called the MFA short story, um, but I, I don't think they're not bad. The MFA short story is a competent short story, it's a, it, but it's a short story usually written by a beginning writer. And, and most writers take a good 10 or 15 years of adulthood be before they begin to find themselves. So that some of this early work gets published now for all kinds of commercial reasons, and some of it is excellent, really excellent, and some of it is falls into a conventional mode that we might call the MFA uh, story. So I think a writing workshop is a great thing to do if it suits what you need at the time. Um, I'm not sure I heard all of that, but you're saying sometimes in school. Uh, in a school situation, not workshop, but in school, uh, course. Yeah. Well, I, when I said was saying wor workshop, I meant to refer to all those classes, which are usually run in a sort of workshop format. Um, and when you, when you take a Master of Fine Arts, you call your writing classes workshops. Again, Writing is writing. The person you are really competing with is yourself. You can go to a workshop that you could have classmates who are really hideous, hideous writers and just don't understand that. You could still come away from that workshop with information, feedback, um, and practice that is useful to yourself. In other words, you can glean what it is you need. Yes, yes, you can, because it's a workshop. It's not a it's not a lecture. Um, if you, if someone gives you a little assignment to do, it may seem like a wincy assignment, but it's not. If you make something big out of it, it's what you choose to do with your ideas and the teacher's ideas that take you where you want to go, which may not be where everyone else is wanting to go, and that's fine. Okay? Yeah. So, I, I want to go a little bit to, I think, I think you're positing a bit of a middle path in how the author should approach, how they think about themselves within their own work and how they appear within quoted at one point uh, a statement about um, um, the idea that an author should give themselves over to the work and rather than sort of try and um, present themselves uh, in the work, rather than sort of force their personality upon the work, which sounds a lot like negative capability. Um, I, I, I don't remember when I said that, but I do, I believe strongly in negative capability. Yeah. So you have this idea of you know, giving yourself over to the work, mm -hmm. and through that you create an authorial self? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I was talking, when I talked about the creation of an authorial self, I'm talking about George Garrett. George Garrett does some things that are not what I want to do. I like to work in all the forms, but I want my poetry to be poetry, my short stories to be short stories, my novels to be novels, etc., etc. And of course, these, these terms are all relative, but still, basically I am not interested in blurring the boundaries. Basically, he was extremely interested in blurring the boundaries. Where this leaves me, I don't know. It may be up a creek. Maybe I'm just going to end up with a lot of work in, in a lot of different forms, and it'll be a hodgepodge, and no one will ever 
be able to put it together. I don't think so, though, because what I do with my different forms is I try to get at similar, the same themes or sometimes even events, but mostly, mostly the same themes from different points of view, because I do think, as Slavitt pointed out and as I read in this essay, that each form gives you a different angle into the world and you understand the world differently depending on the form that you're using. So I'm hoping in the end somebody will be able to make sense out of my work, but we, I, I won't be around to know that. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm not just not going to worry about it. <laughs> I think it's about time to end, right? Isn't there coffee on the way? Thank you. <laughs>